What's up, everyone? This is Niyi Adewale, host of the Akaba Home Financial Freedom Mastermind Group. This group meets virtually every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern, and the members of this group are committed to achieving financial freedom well before the traditional retirement age. So in this podcast, you are going to get VIP access to the conversations we have about different forms of investment and creative ways to get your dollars working harder for you than you originally worked to obtain those dollars. I talked to Ahize a little bit earlier this week. I know you guys wanted to talk a little bit about managing short-term rentals. Yes, we did. Definitely. And do you have some, some prospects out there, some owners that are looking for some help? So that's kind of what we want to talk to you about and tr try to gauge it, gauge it just because it's something that we've discussed as a goal for 2023, a possible goal for 2023. So what we wanted to do was reach out to you because we know that's something that, you know, you are definitely have become, you know, not only accustomed to, but, you know, you, you're running pretty much a machine over there and you're doing a great job. And so we wanted to kind of get some more insight on that and see if it's something that we want to actually pursue. Absolutely. And feel free to flood with questions. I can give you kind of high level what it looks like, but feel free to flood with questions. And before we do that, Gary, how you doing, man? What's going on, my guy? How you doing? I'm super good. I'm super good. And I'm going to put you on the spot for a second. Anytime we have somebody new join the call, we always ask if they could give a little bit of their background and kind of some of their investing goals. Gary, do you mind sharing with the group? How y'all doing, man? So my name is Gary Anacusi. Don't mind the noise in the back. I got the kids and girls right now. All right. My name is Gary Anacusi. I'm an investor. Been in the game, been in investing for about six years now. I own a duplex. I own two properties. I own a single family home and I own a duplex in PA. Long-term goal is to become a developer, a real estate developer. You know, I love the multifamily. I love that industry. So I want to stay that route in regards to multifamily. But, you know, I'm a licensed realtor in Philadelphia. The biggest thing with this is, you know, I'm just thinking long-term, long-term wealth, generational wealth, just leaving a legacy. Um, so, you know, the, the goal... My goal with this is, you know, just to continue to grow and continue to help as many people, you know, along the way while I'm accomplishing my goals. That's all I got. Absolutely. And you are in the right place, right? I think all of us on here have similar goals, which is generational wealth and trying to pass something along to our kids in the future and also to even be able to realize our dreams while we're still here and be able to start building something for our family. So Gary, welcome. And Selena coming back to, and he's coming back to what we were talking about before. So if you have any specific questions, please feel free to fire it. But when I got into the short-term rental management, it, it was by accident almost, right? I had two short-term rentals and I was putting in, I was still working a full-time W-2. I actually technically still am. And I putting in as many systems as I could to automate it and make it to where at least 80% of the messages as well as the day-to-day -day, could be taken off my hands to where I'm only jumping in for the select few. And so by putting those systems in place, I was able to kind of do that. And in talking to other investors, you know, around the way and other people that I had met and invested with, they found value in that and were like, Hey, could you manage mine? And then the referral started to come in and long story short, without really even trying between October and now we've taken on, including my, I just bought one two weeks ago. So including my four, we have 15 under management. And by the end of this year, we're going to have 20 or more. I think it's going to be 20. Some of the team thinks it's going to be like 23 or so, but I've got it in my head about 20 because I have a couple of prospects that I've been talking to. One of the main things that other short-term rental owners or people that are new to this industry are looking for is guidance, right? They're looking for somebody that has the experience that you do, Ahize and Selena. Similar to the questions that we get on this call, you got to be an expert on that market. Like, hey, if somebody's asking, what are the short-term rental laws? Or if they're asking, hey, what about the new ordinance that just hit? He's a, you're an expert because you've been through it. So you could explain to that person, hey, this is exactly how we would get you through that. And this is exactly how you would start to reap the benefits and why this is a good idea for you. You need to know exactly what your pricing is going to be for that person. And then on the back end, you want to start to understand what systems you're going to put into place 
to make managing it seamless and easy for them to where they're not thinking about it constantly. But one of the things that's been pretty incredible is it went from just me kind of being the solo manager, handing all the issues and things of that nature to growing to big enough to where now we have two guest experience managers who are actually on the line, Kiera and Shamika, and we have a maintenance manager who pulled another member onto the team and we're growing rapidly. So it's turning into a, a true business and, and that's what it can get to, but it really starts with that first short-term rental management contract. Ahize, Selena, any questions or anything that was top of mind? Yes, I do. So with managing, you know, you mentioned the 15 currently for being yours. At what point did you feel like it was financially beneficial? Like, you know, with the hours that you were putting in and with, was it after, you know, you've had three properties or was it after you've had seven? When did you feel that was beneficial for you? You're talking about under management? Yeah, under management. I think it was right off the bat. For me personally, in the Atlanta market, because I already had two short-term rentals, this was just gaining economies of scale, right? So now when I talk to the cleaners beforehand, you know, there's going to be easy cleanings and hard cleanings. There's going to be the guests that leave the place spotless like we all would, right? Where they leave and it's like, man, this is great. The cleaners don't have to work super hard. And there's going to be other cleanings where it's like, hey, we spent two hours here when we thought we were only going to be here for an hour, or we spent three hours here and check out these videos and these pictures. And what I would find is when I only had one unit or two units, it'd become another negotiation. Hey, the cleaning's supposed to be 90, but now we need 120, right? Because we had to stay here extra. We had to do this. You know, this isn't our job, et cetera. Once you start to expand to more units and you can give more volume to somebody, now you come into the negotiation power. And so with that, I was able to standardize cleaning pay across the board to where it's cheaper for the owners and cheaper for myself, right? So it's, it's kind of a win on that point. And from a lawn maintenance, from an even maintenance perspective and, and everything that goes into the house, it allows you to negotiate from a stronger position. And so to answer your question, I saw the effects immediately from the first one, but it was because I owned other short-term rentals in that market. And do you have any short-term rentals outside of Atlanta as well, or under, under management that is? Not right now, but Kiara would tell you that that is a goal for us in the future. So Right now, the goal is to build out this in Atlanta and make sure that we have a strong team. I personally, for a personal goal, want to have seven short-term rentals. And so got four, I think we'll hit seven by next year. I'm working with a couple partners to accomplish that. And then it'll be testing other markets outside of Atlanta, seeing how we would pull a new cleaning team, new maintenance, man, all that stuff, right? I think we could still use the same guest experience team because you could do that from anywhere, but there, there's a lot that you need to put in place to make it happen, but that is a goal. That's a goal. I don't want to put a time on it yet, but if, if you know, we hit that seven next year, hopefully shortly after that, we'll expand somewhere outside of the metro Atlanta area. Okay. Okay. And so a couple other questions. I don't want to take from anyone. So if anyone wants, if we want to pause and go to somebody else and, you know. No, he's a, you're you, Hey, come on now. You got the floor. You know, this is the open session. So <laughs> hey, feel free. Okay. Okay, so going back to the pricing, so um, so on a short-term rental, so let's say you take over, you know, the properties you have under management, one, how did you determine what percentage to charge? And then two, is it automated where it automatically pays you per month or are you waiting for the owner to, you know, transfer the funds or cut you a check or how does that work? So it works twofold. The cool thing about Airbnb is if you're signed up as a co-host, they allow you to split payments among as many accounts as you want. And so the way I set it up with owners is there's an onboarding fee that I charge. And the reason there's an onboarding fee is because we take care of everything. We take it from the house could be fully empty. We've had owners that we've taken on that literally just moved like, you know, a a week notice, hey, we got to move, left all this stuff in there. We had to clean it up move new furniture in, purchase everything and kind of get it up and running. We've had owners that have had furniture, but just it wasn't set up in the correct way to run an operation. And so we'll take it wherever you're at. And then we have to set you up in our system to automate as much as we can. So for Airbnb, it's a split system. We both get paid at the same time because they have it kind of figured out. And then for VRBO, it doesn't work like that because they don't currently, at least as far as I know, allow for a co-host function. And so with VRBO, I explained to the owners that this is going to come through my personal account. 
So all the VRBOs are tied to me. That being said, anytime there's a check-in, I send owners the full details. And then I put a check in the mail for the percentage of their cut to the owners each time. Okay. So it, okay. So you pretty much manage all the earnings from VRBO. From VRBO. Yes. I actually yeah. really like Airbnb though, just because that's yeah. done. And then anytime we get a direct booking, cause we do have that direct booking site that we talked about a while ago, same thing as VRBO. Okay. Selena, I know we had some other questions you want to ask. Just curious, and I know each property would be different, but on average, how much time would you say that you spend per property, whether it's a given week or a given month, probably a given month, better to gauge? That's a good question. I'm actually going to kick it now to Kiera and Shamika to answer because they more closely handle guests now. Either one, please feel free to chime in. So I would say it depends on the day of the week. We definitely get a lot more bookings over the weekends. So we spend more time answering guest questions that come in, but say like a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, we still get booked, but the questions are less during the week than they are during the weekend hours for guests. And it really depends on the time of day. Generally during check-in, we get a lot of questions and during check out sometimes, but we have a lot of things automated. So a lot of things are taken care of too, from a guest perspective. Okay. And, and how about in regards to, and what I mean by time, not only the time that you guys are spending online, answering those questions or addressing those questions, but whether it's, you know, hiring or, you know, you making the calls, whether it's to vendors, such as maintenance, cleaning, whatever it is, I'm trying to average and see, you know, how much time would one like, you know, he's saying I have to spend outside of our corporate jobs to manage something like this if we were to get into this type of business? Yeah, it really depends on how you set it up, right? Because I, I was doing the same thing that you are, right? Working full-time W-2 and, and kind of working through this and thankfully have met a couple of rock stars and been able to say, hey, this is your portion. And then there's just a couple of questions here and there, but pretty much there's a process in place. I'd say across the different teams, what we do is we utilize like group chats. So we have a guest turnover group chat where everybody's sending messages in there. And, you know, if there's supplies that are needed, the cleaning team knows that's on them to let us know. And we add it to a list and we get stuff shipped there. There's a maintenance group text where if there's anything that the cleaners find that's maintenance required, that's their first task is to send us a picture, send us a video, get it into the chat so we can get it to our maintenance chat and they can get out there. I would say the main thing that you need to be clear on to kind of not eat up your time significantly is not necessarily the guests, but it, go, it falls back to the owners, right? So a lot of these owners are going to be newer to the game and may not have had even regular property management in the past. And so I've had a bunch of property managers and I've had really bad ones. I've had okay ones and I've had great ones. And the people that haven't had a property manager in the past may not recognize that, hey, you've got somebody that actually owns real estate and is doing this and treating your property the same way that everybody else is. And so they may try to micromanage you in the beginning. So you really just got to set boundaries and you really have to be clear on kind of your whole process and how you work everything. For example, typically when we get a new owner, um, a booking request will come in and you know how these bookings come in. They have no reviews, anything, but you see the dollar signs. And the new owner will just accept it. And it's like, dude, what are you doing? You know, so we got to hop on a line and say, hey, that's, the, that's a no-no. We got this, right? Like, don't do that. So I would say most of the time is spent training some of the new owners. But if you have solid processes in place and you also have kind of like a, a sheet of, hey, this is what we charge for this, et cetera, I think you'll be fine. Wonderful. Okay, Thank so you. so the so going back to Selena's question. So, well, two things. So for a time perspective. So I don't know, Kira, I don't know if you answered and, you know, kind of estimated, but I'm just wondering, like, are you guys doing the walkthroughs or you're just relying solely on the cleaners to tell you? Yeah. So I'm still trying to under, cause we don't really, I'll be honest. Like we don't really have a lot of automated. We only have one property right now. And so we have the automated as far as like our price, our pricing tool. 
And we do have automated messages that go out, but Selena, you know, kind of manages the inbox or, you know, the communication. It's, you know, sometimes we split that as well. And then from a property management perspective, you know, I kind of do that part of it. I mean, I do do that part of it. So, you know, I'm doing a walkthrough after the guest leaves, even before the cleaning people come. And sometimes I clean, you know, or most times I was cleaning until recently. And so it makes me feel better to do that walkthrough. And I'll give an example. Like I showed, I sent Selena pictures, like I found hair on the floor. There was a, a Windex bottle still out. And the beds, one, you know, there's two beds in the room. One bed was tucked in, one bed wasn't. So it's like, which way are we going? You know, like that bugs me. <laughs> and so. EJ, let me, let me ask you this, right? Because I know you have, you know, the one property in Atlanta. How many do you want to have in Atlanta, ideally? I would say within, I would say if we can manage it, you know, property manage, I would say six months from now, like at least three to six months, at least four. So let me, let me ask you this, right? Say you have guests on a Sunday checking out at 11, new guests checking in at 3 p.m. Are you physically going to be able to get to four properties and clean Mm-mm. them personally and then walk them? Absolutely not. So, so to that point, with that in mind, you've got to build systems and think through it. And now that you have one, this is the time to do it. You got to think through, okay, how can I incentivize different parties to where they're going to be just as ingrained with me as, as I would be, right? Because when I had the one, I was doing the same thing, right? But then I quickly realized, hey, if we're going to build this thing out and you're working a full-time W-2, there's no way. There's no way. People are going to question why you're gone for four hours, <laughs> right? It, it, every single day, right? And so one of the ways that we've been able to do it, at least from a cleaning perspective, is we pay our cleaners standard pay because we have enough units, right? And so they're going to get a base amount regardless of anything. So they prioritize our units because they know, hey, I got this base pay coming in. And that's one of the most important parts of this whole business. And then on the back end, there's a bonus that's tied to the cleanliness rating of each unit. So as you know, if you're a 4.8 or higher overall, you're going to get a super host. I don't want them to feel, you know, slighted if we're down in other categories. So we focus on the cleanliness category. If a unit is a 4.8 or higher, at the beginning of the month, when the paychecks go out, they get a bonus for that unit. And it happens across the board. If it starts to slip, it's going to be noticeable. And so to answer your question, we don't personally walk the units because that would just, it, it would get crazy with 15, but we do incentivize the cleaners. And if they start to slip up, the best barometer you can have is a guest reporting it. And at that point, then it's an issue. Then we're having discussions and then we're figuring out next steps from there. That's awesome. And thanks for sharing that because I think the idea of giving them incentive or a bonus definitely helps make them a little bit more invested in making sure it's clean thoroughly. Absolutely. And I know Shamika, you were going to comment before on a little bit of the timing. Did you want to? Oh, I mean, Kira said what I was going to say, but then, you know, I'm only a week in as of right now. But as far as time and it's like, I do have to be, and I know you guys already have a property now, but being that like I have six that I'm um, supporting and I'm on my phone, making sure that I'm not getting messages, you know, throughout the day. I mean, I'm typically like in bed by 10 o'clock, but if, if I'm up and something does come through, then I'm on it as much as I can. But sometimes, you know, there's people, oh my God, hold on, can y'all hear that? I'm outside. And yeah, it's my hear- yeah. No, it was like it's no, it's gunshot. What? Yes. And I was sitting outside. Did you hear that? Yeah. Okay. Did sorry. Sorry, y'all. Uh, I thought uh, that was knocking. I me just too. no. I was outside sitting on my front, and there was gunshots. Oh wow. Oh. Yes. I don't know where it came from. I don't think it was in the neighborhood, but it sounded outside the neighborhood. I'm so sorry. No worries. <laughs> As I was like, ran there, in, yeah. I'm good. I ran in the house because I didn't know where it was coming from. Okay. But as I was saying, like, I'll be, if I'm up at night, and sometimes when you're up at night, there's things that are coming through where they're inquiring about booking the place. So if I'm up past 10, I may respond. So I would say as far as timing, I mean, you're doing it all day, every day. But I mean, like Kiera said, there's 
the weekends when it's busy, if somebody is like asking questions, if they're in, you know, the property or anything like that, but yeah. Okay. So, yeah. And I would say from a timing perspective with us, like, you know, again, we only have one, but I don't feel like we spend that much time, you know, even like, I don't spend, like if I, if I spend four hours, it's like maybe once every other week or something. So it's not that much. And I guess, I don't know, I, but I understand what you're saying. Like, I definitely, if we're going to scale up, we're going to have to scale something back and in order to provide that time. And then even with having properties like off the back, did you guys, did you have assistance um, initially or did you get to a certain point and say, okay, I have 15 now, now I need additional help? Yeah, I think it's, it just depends on your bandwidth, right? So I think we had seven, like we had like six or seven and I remember, so I was having conversations about it and it was kind of in my head and kind of mapping it out. I don't know if you've ever read that book, Attraction, but read that book and it was hugely impactful. It was talking about the importance of a team, of having rock stars, of having individuals that take ownership and, and, and incentivize to make sure that you can build like a culture and things of that nature. And so when we got to six or seven, it was getting toward the summertime. And there was one weekend, I'll never forget, I was out of town and like three HVACs went out and it's like, okay, <laughs> so now I'm, I'm out of town. I'm like at like a work event and I'm calling plumbers, calling HVAC people to come in and get all these issues fixed. And then I'm trying to coordinate like, okay, now you got to unlock the door and all this stuff. I'm like, you know what? I think it's time to start building a team because there's more on the horizon, right? I was talking to a bunch of different owners. I still am. And there's a lot still coming in the pipeline, right? Where it's just a timing thing. Like, hey, it may not be this month, but next month we've got three coming up. And so with all that being said, I think it just it depends on your bandwidth, you'll know. But what I would recommend is to hire before you need it, to start talking to people and bringing on the rock stars before you need it, because it can grow pretty quickly, especially after you get the first one and you figure out the process and your pricing and things of that nature. And more than happy to talk to you and Selena one off about that, you know, the whole contracts, pricing, all that stuff. But yeah, once you, once you start to get going, it can grow fast. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Fair enough. Yes. Thank you. Of course. Now that was like a, a deep dive on short-term rentals, but definitely wanted to open up to the group. Are there any other topics that are top of mind or anything that you kind of wanted to, to talk about on tonight's call? And Gary, I know we talked a little bit earlier about short-term rentals potentially. Did this help? And is there any questions that kind of popped to mind while we were going through all this? Yes, this actually helped. Y'all kind of opened my eyes to something new. Now, how do I get started? If I wanted to get into what's what would be the first step that I need to do? Because it sounds like a lot of people on here is experienced in short-term rentals. I have no experience in short-term rentals, but I want to get in the game. So what will be my first step with short-term rentals? I'm in Philadelphia market. I would say the first step is, you know, to, <laughs> if I would review the kind of the analytics in the area to determine, you know, based on, cause it sounds like you have long-term rental or renters in there and just kind of get an assessment of what, you know, what's currently happening in the short-term rental market there. If you're kind of, you know, near the city or near a hospital or whatever the case, arenas or whatever that is. And then once you determine that, the, the next step would be to furnish the house or furnish the, the duplex. And especially since you have a multi-unit, that's one of our goals as well. Like, I, I think that's very beneficial because you can do a long-term on one side and short term the other so you're getting the best of both worlds so that way you're just trying out one side but that's what I would say initially and, and, and most just... importantly and probably he said you could probably co-sign on this and most importantly probably do a little bit of research as far as the laws within Philadelphia or the city in which you're I mean, yeah, the area in which you're in to see what the regulations are in terms of setting up an Airbnb. Like, do they allow short-term <laughs> rentals? And if they do, what, you know, what's the paperwork in which you have to fill out? Do you have to fill one out before you start the business? We have a friend of ours who did one in New Orleans and her process took, did she say about a year? Yeah, it took, it took about a, a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
and opposed to us, it took us, you know, just a few months. So it was a little bit different. Like our process in Atlanta was a lot easier than hers in New Orleans. Yeah, that's it. Mm-hmm. And Gary, you were going to say something? Thank you. Thank you all who called in and who ch- um, chimed in. I appreciate that. Appreciate the feedback. And one other piece along Ahize's lines, we actually have one of our owners who is expanding quickly with his portfolio because he saw just the benefits of of using us for the short-term rental management, but he does have a multi-unit. We just took one of his units live. It's like a fourplex. um, And he plans to convert at least one more of those. The game plans to do exactly what you said, Ahize, have two of them be the long-term that can kind of cover the mortgage. And then the other two be the significant cash flow through the Airbnb, kind of getting the best of both worlds. All right, guys. Shamika, you got anything on your mind? Sorry, I was trying to unmute. No, I do not. Kier, what about you? I'm still thinking through some lending questions. So I have a meeting with a lender on Friday and I have some questions for the lender. One about gifting money and how that's taxed. Does the IRS tax a certain amount after of money that you gift over? And then just how, from a gifting perspective, how that plays into loan terms when investing into a short-term rental. So I'm curious if anyone on the line knows anything about how the IRS taxes a certain amount of gifted money that's going towards a loan, that would be greatly appreciated. So IRS tax on gifting is, that's a tough one for me. I don't actually, and I've actually gifted. (laughs) So I don't, I don't know. I don't know on that piece, but as far as the, the bank piece, he's a question for you. Do you know how much you're allowed to loan someone on a conventional or to gift someone on a conventional versus FHA? That is a great question. I can only speak from my experience because I don't work in the home lending side of the bank. But when I purchased my first home, my mother did give me a significant gift. Um, I remember documents being signed. Again, this was like 20 years ago. I don't know. It was a long time. But I just remember like there was a letter she had to sign basically to say that she didn't require repayment. And it it was significant. It was about $40,000 gift. So I had a conventional loan. I don't remember it being any problems with it. But again, this was during the time, this was like 2000 six or seven during the time people were doing anything (laughs) to get a mortgage, I guess. So I don't know. Rules have probably changed. I can definitely look it up and research it or, you know, get with one of my partners at work that work in that area and and send back information to you guys. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's good to hear that nothing was like, you know, messed up with the conventional loan as well. It's not 40,000. So I'm not gifting over 40,000. So that's good to hear. (laughs) I just I just read something that said in 2021 you can gift up to 15,000 to someone in a year and generally not have to deal with IRS about it. In 2022 this increased to 16,000. Okay. So thank you. That's good to know. Yeah, and I'm doing like about 15,000, so I think that should be fine. Hopefully the lender doesn't have to report it. I've been doing my own research on it, but I'm not sure like of course, I want to speak to the lender just to confirm if I need to gift it over earlier or not. True, true. And there's so many lenders out here. The one that you're going to meet with will hopefully have those answers for you and be able to, to talk through conventional versus FHA because there are different rules. For example, when it comes to even getting like seller credits, I've helped a couple of clients that are FHA, a couple that are conventional. And I believe as of right now for conventional, the max you can get in credits is about 2%. And for FHA, you can still get 3% with some lenders and some lenders can go all the way up to four or 5%, but it's, it's, uh, they're trying to tighten down how much you can get, especially from, you know, investment loans and things of that nature to make it more attainable for first-time home buyers. Cause it is, it is getting crazy out there for first-time home buyers.
But guys, any other questions or topics? Kier, since you're looking at mortgages and what are the rates right now? Do you know? I think they're around 6%. I, they did do like a drop to like 5% and then they went back up to six. So I've been keeping an eye out on them. Um, I still personally think it's a, a great time to buy just because I'm, I'm really bought into bigger pockets and just mm -hmm. really listening more to like real estate podcasts. But I, I think there's always a need and especially with the housing shortage, but I think they're around like 6% or something. I'm going to keep an eye out on it. It would be nice if they drop some more, but I do think we have a little bit of leverage right now as a buyer because yes. So many people are, are scared to get into the game right now because of the increase in rates. That is true. hundred percent true. Like I'm seeing, we're able to negotiate for a lot more credits. You're able to, you know, go under asking and the homes are going to appraise because other homes have sold for more. It's just at this time period, sellers are a little bit scared. And if their home sits for seven days, which is not long at all in historical context, they're willing to will and deal with you because they're used to it selling in like three days, multiple offers over the last two years. So it's, it's a good time. It's a good time. And for just a, a point of reference, I just closed on a house a week and a half ago. My interest rate was 6.25. I think it's stabilizing right around six, right between 5.75 and like 6.25. I think it's stabilizing a little bit. Now we'll see what the Fed does in a couple of weeks. Is that investment like interest rate or as a primary or secondary home? That was a conventional investment. I put 15% down. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. That's not bad at all. Yeah. I was surprised too. Cause you know, when we first went in, which was, I think I got it under contract in April with those multiple extensions we had because interest rates kept going up. I was able to go back to the seller and negotiate more and negotiate more and get a lot of stuff fixed up that normally would not. And um, so, yeah. So in between that time, they were able to, to relock the rate at a little bit lower. Okay. Are you able to refinance an investment loan if you purchase it? Okay. Absolutely. That and that's, yeah. that's part of the goal. Like what you mentioned earlier, Kiara, is, hey, you can still find opportunities to find these houses and get them at a decent price. And the cool thing is at a certain point, we're going to return to potentially lower interest rates. So if interest rates were to drop to, you know, 5% two years from now or, or four and a half percent, that's exactly what I'd do. Refinance, now have a lower payment. I can actually take cash out if I want and still keep the same payment or leave the cash in and just have a lower payment and take more cash flow. So to your point, I'm trying to acquire as many as I can right now, either personally or through partnerships. And then when the time comes, refinance and kind of keep going from there. That's awesome. Thank you. Of course. All right, y'all. Hey. Thank you all for joining tonight. Again, it's a pleasure seeing everybody thriving. And Gary, welcome to the group. And yeah, if you need anything, please feel free to reach out. Ahize, Selena, I can send you a link to the calendar if you guys want to talk through some of the numbers. But until next time, please be safe. Especially yes. you, Shamika. I don't know what's going on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you guys. Bye.